bring it up just a hair more in the rope. Go ahead and try it. Testing. Work. Um, I'm going to talk about the FDA regulatory requirements regarding clinical investigators and we'll provide some case examples um, that hopefully will make it easier for you to understand. Let's start with a sad story. This is an example uh, regarding a young lady who was a healthy volunteer and wanted to participate in a clinical investigation. Um, the protocol, the study protocol, excluded subjects who were pregnant. So who had chorionic gonadotropin level of more than 5.0 daily international unit per ml was tested as positive and was supposed to be, was required by the protocol to be excluded from the study. Um, however, the clinical investigator enrolled and randomized the subject into the study and the subject received multiple doses of uh, teratogenic study drug. And I will continue the rest of the case uh, later on as we go over some regulatory requirements. So hold on to this right now. And let's give um, the outline. So we'll go over some regulatory requirements for clinical investigators and uh, a brief description of the inspection process, uh, um, outcome of these inspections, and some case examples. Uh, we'll do also some analysis of the reason uh, that noncompliance might happen. Um, <clears throat> so in this slide, you are seeing the relationship between um, all these entities that are involved in uh, a clinical investigation. Um, the red circle indicates where the clinical investigator stands. So uh, the position is directly responsible in the conduct of the study and uh, is the closest entity to conduct the clinical investigation. And the sponsor who initiates the clinical investigation um, is in relationship with the clinical investigator, provides the protocol, and uh, uh, reports are supposed to report uh, the adverse events or communications happen between the clinical investigator, sponsor, the investigational um, review board, institutional review board, IRB, and as well as the IEC, um, International Ethics Committee, uh, so independent ethics committees, and the FDA over oversees all of these um, at the same time. So um, the importance of to understand the uh, clinical investigator's responsibility as the res uh, individual who is mostly responsible for the conduct of the uh, study. In the bioresearch monitoring program, BIMO, um, <clears throat> which is a comprehensive program that FDA established in 1977, uh, after about 14 years, um, after the IND uh, regulations went into effect in 2003, um, the BIMO program is um, uh, overseeing uh, several programs that are involved in the FDA regulated research, including clinical investigators, sponsors, which include also monitors, CROs, contract research organizations and uh, sponsor investigators, which are the um, academic or research uh, uh, individuals, and um, non-clinical laboratory institutions, bioequivalence uh, programs, as well as the IRB program. However, today's discussion is mainly on the clinical investigators. So the purpose of the BIMO uh, program is to ensure that the uh, study uh, is protecting subjects' rights, safety, and welfare, um, and uh, as well as to ensure and, valid, and evaluate the data uh, reliability and accuracy, uh, which the data we know 
is going to be submitted if submitted to the sponsor or the FDA. Um, if there is a marketing approval, um, uh, so and all, all we also to assess the compliance uh, of the site uh, while they're conducting the clinical investigation. So why did I pick this topic, clinical investigators? Because they have every year they have the highest number of good clinical practice inspections uh, among the uh, all of the entities, the sponsor. IRBs and clinical investigators, these are the, these get the highest number of inspections every year, and they get the highest number of warning letters in CEDAR. So, um, that, uh, and, and we had the BIMO talk yesterday that we had all those big numbers of uh, warning letters issued. So this number is the highest within the CEDAR GCP program. And uh, clinical investigators are, as I said, most responsible for the conduct of the clinical investigation. So as you see, this is a um, graph that shows you the inspection, the number of inspections in uh, fiscal year 2017. Uh, the clinical investigators had more than 500 inspections, and the IRB is about 100 sponsors, about 70 uh, inspections for this year. I would like to go over some regulatory requirements, and I know these are just not but I wanted to make it easy for you and uh, group them together um, so we have a better understanding of these requirements. Um, with regard to the informed consent processes, um, all the regulations really make sense. And they are about obtaining a legally effective informed consent, having all the basic elements the minimum required basic elements of informed consent that would describe a statement that the investigation is experimental, uh, what you are receiving, the risks, the benefits, the alternative treatments, um, any compensation in case of health-related injury during the uh, study, or um, any um, or other components that are necessary, minimum necessary components of informed consent. Um, and uh, we have other um, important regulations that include uh, adherence to the investigational plan, which every year we get the most number of citations on our letters. Um, and that's about failure to adhere to the investigational plan. And that's the, that would include the protocol. Um, record keeping and retention, um, that includes the records the data that are collected at uh, clinical sites um, need to reflect um, accurate, legible, original, attributable, contemporaneous documentation of the data that was um, documented at the time of the visit. And any change with regard to the data should, must be documented um, with regard to the date time, who changed, reason for the change, and uh, all the requirements regard to have an accurate um, assessment of what happened during the investigation. So that's really easy and makes sense. Um, about retention of the records, the sites are required to retain all the study records and regulatory documents for at least two years after the marketing, ap uh, marketing application was approved or was withdrawn by the sponsor, um, or for any reason the application was not submitted to the FDA. So for at least two years, remember that number. Um, then we have reporting requirements, reporting to, of the adverse events and serious adverse events requirement to the sponsor, um, reporting all of the unanticipated events that happens uh, during the investigational, uh, the, 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 during the study, and anything, any change in the study, any revision to the informed consent must be submitted to the IRB um, and all the, um, uh, the initial uh, protocol as well as the um, amended protocol, version of the protocol must be uh, approved by the IRB before you do your enrollment. 
And we have also regulations with regard to the control of investigational drug. That means that this, uh, the clinical investigator is responsible to personally or personally administer or supervise the administration of the study drug or delegate it to the sub-investigator. And handling of controlled substances, uh, maintaining, uh, storing the controlled substances um, in a locked cabinet, and not everybody must should have access to, it shouldn't be easily accessible, and the regulations about disqualification of clinical investigators. So let's go over some um, uh, facts about inspection. So what happens during an inspection? What triggers the inspection? And uh, what's the outcome? Um, we receive several um, reports, complaints, um, consults, and my center will evaluate all of these and will assess whether there is a need to uh, conduct an inspection of the clinical investigator site. Most of our inspections are data audit, pre-approval uh, inspections. However, we do have a small component of uh, complaints and reports from the sponsors, IRBs, uh, or other sources regarding a clinical site. Um, so after we issue the inspection to the Office of Regulatory Affairs, which are the part, part of BIMO program, um, the field investigators from this different dis district offices, depending on where the clinical site is located, um, they will send a field investigator to the site, and uh, an inspection will be conducted to evaluate all of those, they go over all of those that I just described, and they will check uh, whether the documents were accurate, the Alcoa principle, uh, uh, the data uh, integrity, reliability, and whether the clinical investigator adhered to the plan, and whether the reports were done on time and promptly, and, uh, and etc. And then, based on the findings, the um, field investigator will um, issue or not issue a form uh, FDA 483 if there is any finding that uh, is serious and significant or uh, anything that deserves to be on a form 483. And as well as the field investigator will uh, put together a narrative uh, in an uh, establishment inspection report, and that will be reviewed by our center, um, as well as uh, the written response from the clinical investigator, if it was provided to us. Um, especially, I will go over the written response later on. Um, and then we will review that and uh, make a decision uh, about the final classification of this inspection. Based on the final classification, you will either receive an NAI, no action indicated letter, correspondence, or VAI, voluntary action indicated, or OAI, official action indicated letter. Um, so if you receive a Form 483, do you think you're required to respond? Who thinks? Yes? Okay. You are not required, actually, to respond. However, we do encourage you to respond and put all the details about uh, explaining what happened and uh, why this violation happened. And if you have anything to disprove the observation. Um, but we do recommend that you respond. Um, uh, so um, if you respond, we will review your response if it's within 15 business days after the 483 was issued to you. And if not, if you send it later, we will, we will look at it, but we don't consider it in our evaluation of the uh, final classification. So um, the timing is important. Uh, does it help? Uh, as I said, yes, uh, it might help. Uh, it might mitigate the violations. If you find any serious violations, it might disprove if you provide enough uh, evidence uh, that uh, that didn't happen or 
this was the reason for which it, was ha it happened, or you can clarify at least. Um, uh, so, so, so it's important to send a response, <laughs> bottom line. So the final classification, if you don't find any uh, violations, uh, you will receive a correspondence as NAI, no action indicated. If we find uh, regulatory violations, we assess the significance of these regulatory violations. So the significance, if they are few and uh, minimally significant, you might receive a voluntary action indicated. If they don't have, they didn't have um, significant impact on the subject safety, rights and welfare, or on data reliability or data integrity, then um, you would receive a VAI letter. However, if these uh, violations, we assess them and we find out that they are serious and they have significant impact on data integrity, reliability, or subject safety, uh, rights and welfare, then uh, we will consider issuing an OAI letter. And there are, uh, the first level of an OAI letter that are um, informal and advisory uh, are the warning letters. The warning letters, uh, we issue them because we want to give you an opportunity to um, take voluntary and prompt corrective action. And, uh, but it's not a prerequisite for an enforcement action. So it's a regulatory action, but doesn't mean that you will, that we will take an enforcement action. Uh, so we will give you time that within 15 uh, working days after the receipt of the warning letter, um, provide us with your corrective and preventive actions and um, put all the descriptions of your um, plan, of your corrective action plan. I call it CAPA, corrective action, preventive action plan. And, um, uh, and also, a warning letter um, is not, uh, does not commit FDA to take an enforcement action, as I said. So um, after uh, we issued a forwarding letter and we receive your response, um, we will consider doing a follow-up inspection. So the follow-up inspection is uh, done because we want to see if you repeated the violations, if um, you pro your promised corrective actions and, and preventive actions were implemented, and to ensure that the compliance at your site has been sustained. So if all of those are done uh, appropriately, then we can consider issuing a closeout letter. Um, however, if we find um, repeatedly and deliberately, so intentional uh, regulatory violations that uh, indicate that there was a false um, falsification of the data and the falsified information was submitted to the FDA to the sponsor and or to the FDA um, then we will consider um, initiating a disqualification procedure and that's um, uh, in that's given issued in a NITPO letter notice of initiation oh sorry notice of initiation uh, uh, of disqualification proceeding, an opportunity to explain. So um, if you respond to the NITPO letter and provide adequate explanation and uh, adequate response, um, uh, you can also um, indicate uh, that you want to request for an uh, informal, uh, uh, informal conference or uh, write in writing, uh, put, in, put it into writing, or, uh, uh, or, or if not, if your response, we will assess your response. If it's not adequate, we consider other uh, paths that might uh, uh, progress into an, uh, an NOH letter notice for a, a, to re for a hearing, as well as a complete disqualification. So let's start with some examples. I finished talking. This was a very detailed, but it was a brief summary of our inspection processes and the outcomes. Uh, however, I would like to start uh, providing you with some examples about uh, regulatory violations that might happen during a study. So in this case, we received a report that, uh, from a sponsor 
that the clinical investigator did not retain any record, paper or electronic, at the site, uh, including case report forms, source documents, or any signed informed consent from the subject. So we conducted the inspection, and uh, we found that the clinical investigator enrolled about uh, 22 subjects, um, had done all the study, but we, we were not able to verify any data. If all the records were shredded or destroyed um, two years after the study was terminated uh, at the site. And uh, we, we also uh, noticed that the sponsor withdrew the IND and terminated the study, the overall study, about one and a half years before the FDA inspection. So what do you think was wrong here? What was the non-compliance? Timing, exactly. But timing, uh, he, we found out that the clinical investigator misunderstood the regulation. And um, from, he basically, he was required to retain the study records at least two years after the sponsor had terminated the IND and the FTA was notified about the termination, not two years after the study was terminated at his site. So that's the misunderstanding. So he received a warning letter for that. The second example goes over um, a, a case that the sponsor reported us that couldn't verify the data because the, there was confusion or um, lack of adherence to the protocol. So the clinical investigator, um, the, the, the protocol actually required that the subjects be assigned to, the, um, to different groups based on their response to the uh, oncologic treatment into complete responders, partial responders, uh, stable versus progressive disease. And every one of those had its own definition. Um, the, the, we found out during our inspection that the clinical investigator enrolled 50 subjects. And uh, for almost half of the subjects, he did an incorrect assignment of the subjects into these. So um, when, when he wrote the response to the 483, he described that he, uh, his understanding of the uh, complete responders was different from what the protocol has required. So um, that's an example where there was significant impact on data integrity, and you cannot rely on that data. And for that, we issued a warning letter. Um, case example three, in this case, is kind of uh, uh, we, re we received a report of scientific misconduct. Um, the protocol had required that physical exams um, must be done by the clinical investigator. So this is a protocol requirement, and that the, per, that the physical exam must be reported on the case report forms um, by the clinical investigator. So we found out during the inspection that the clinical investigator had signed and dated all the physical exam case report forms when he was out of state. So on the date that he was out of state, he documented all of those physical exams that have happened. And um, we also found that the study coordinator enrolled sub site employees using fabricated names and data. And these falsified data were all submitted to the sponsor and to the FDA. So bottom line, CI failed to adequately supervise the conduct of the study. And therefore, we initiated and completed the disqualification process, um, which means that the clinical investigator is not entitled to receive any investigational drug, animal drugs, biologic devices, or food additives, and is not entitled to conduct any further studies intended or required for submission to the FDA for any investigational article, or article re regulated by FDA. However, this clinical investigator can serve as a sub-investigator in the future. So let's get back to our story. So as I said, this subject was pregnant 
and was enrolled and randomized into the study and received multiple doses of teratogenic drug. What happened is um, on first visit, uh, as you see, I, um, so the pregnancy, positive pregnancy level was 5. First visit, she had 80. And um, the document, the lab report, and the subject eligibility was uh, recorded and documented as proceed to enrollment and signed by the clinical investigator. Then next visit in two weeks, the subject's HCG level was 20,000. And again, the document was uh, signed and dated and agreed to continue in the study. So this, these are the pre-screening and screening uh, labs. And then the third visit in two weeks, the levels of HCG were 100,000. And uh, still the clinical investigator signed and dates the document and subject gets the study drug. Um, for, uh, for a few weeks, uh, she doesn't show up and then calls the site and, and lets them know that uh, she had a miscarriage. So um, that's what happened. And um, when we discussed it with the clinical investigator, I mean, in his written, written response, he discussed that he, the problem was that the lab didn't flag all the abnormal results. But he didn't also look at the lab results. And uh, so as part of the uh, corrective action, preventive action, he required and communicated with the lab that the, to flag all the abnormal results and so for him to be able to see. Um, let's do a root cause analysis of the noncompliance issues here. When I talk about a site that doesn't function um, as a compliant site, I thought about the disease status in the body. So it looks like we can find um, I think it's working now. And uh, there we can find a mechanism, a pathophysiology assess diagnosis. Um, testing, does it work? Um, okay, so assessing and making a diagnosis, what was wrong, what went wrong, and start doing a treatment. So providing a preventive and corrective action plan and following up on your treatment. So this exactly looks like a similar uh, situation where you have a disease. So what are the potential etiologies? For noncompliance, we can divide them into intentional and non-intentional etiologies, but I don't want to put a name on them. So let's say training. Most of the time, the staff are not adequately trained on their responsibilities. Um, they get hired, new to the job, they don't know the protocol, they don't know the investigational plan, and things happen. Um, unqualified staff. So uh, you don't, you, you don't uh, hire a dentist for a lymphoma study. Or uh, you, you don't, delegation, inadequate delegation of the responsibilities. Um, who is doing what in your site? So you need to know um, and take it serious. Also, when the, the staff are overworked and there are so many things to do in one day, uh, you want to do everything, and you skip the, the, the quality. Um, so uh, the other factor could be misunderstanding of the regulations. Um, the regulations are there, but you need to translate them into simple language, reasonable to put it into, uh, to apply. Um, then this philosophy of fear or desire. Most people do things because they have uh, fear of losing. Uh, position or something, or desire to have more uh, prestige or more um, academic positions, 
uh, so, so you lose the quality or quantity. Um, when things happen, uh, most of the time they have they happen in a chain. So when there is poor super supervision at the clinical site by the clinical investigator, study coordinator will in, might I'm not saying will, but might start doing things that is not supposed to do. So enrolling subjects that are not eligible for the study. Um, so protocol violations can happen, falsifications can happen, and so on. Um, but you can start treatment for most of the non-compliance issues, not all of them, though. Um, so start when, uh, as soon as you can. Um, so the plan starts when you commit to a plan. Commit and have a timeline for yourself. Make a plan, implement your preventive and corrective action plan, and then check whether they work. Evaluate your uh, implementation. Um, for the corrective action and preventive action plan, these are all uh, things that came into, uh, usually come with the res written response. And uh, we do recommend, we cannot tell you how to do a corrective action or preventive action, but uh, it's good to establish uh, all GCP aspects of the clinical research, as well as focusing on the violations that were included in the letter. So take care of those. Uh, make a plan. Hire qualified staff. Train your uh, study team. Strengthen the site infrastructure for your study. Um, design your um, compliance based on the type of the study. Some studies are more complex, require more staff, more training. And uh, so know what your protocol is and tailor your compliance based on your protocol. And then after, once you implement your corrective preventive action, um, make sure you sustain it. We had cases where uh, we did the follow-up inspection after an OAI was issued. And um, the follow-up inspection was fine, but in two years, another inspection uh, was again another OEI. So sustaining the compliance is uh, important. There are several resources to learn to do better. Uh, uh, communicating with the IRB during um, the, uh, you know, uh, all the IRB audits, sponsors, sponsors, monitors, uh, when they're monitoring your study, ask your questions, make sure you're uh, correcting the noncompliance, and um, there are private consultants, educational conferences. FDA has several guidances on this issue. However, I wanted to just um, emphasize on the importance of a quality system for clinical research that, that uh, has four fundamental factors, including ma a good management, day-to-day -day, uh, work at your site. Um, it's not just a scientific expertise. It's necessary, but it's not just that. Uh, regulatory knowledge, know the regulations and the re requirements, and a good leadership. So in summary, we went over the, uh, the fact that CIs are re eventually responsible for the conduct of the study. Um, having a good compliance at your site uh, can protect subject safety, rights and welfare, as well as giving more reliable data. And non-compliance can have one or more reasons. And most non-compliance, luckily, are uh, preventable or can be corrected. Thank you. For any questions, please. I, I turned the mic on. <laughs> uh, and we do have time for some Q&A for uh, Farinac. Uh, so those of you in the room, if you do have questions, please go ahead and line up at the microphones, and we'll take them. As, and there we go, right off the bat. Please go ahead, nice and close in the microphone for me, please. Two questions, if possible. Yeah, go yes. ahead. Just um, actually, you get one, and then we'll try the others, because we only got three and a half minutes. Go ahead, please. OK. Um, does the FDA conduct um, inspections during a study, or only at the end? Well, it depends on the type of inspection um, for the data audit, pre-approval inspections, um, the timing. We get consults from the OND, lots of new drug 
review divisions, one of the review divisions, and uh, based on that, we consider the inspection. Those are the pre-approval inspections. However, for the, the inspections that are based on complaints or reports from the sponsor or complaints from any source, that can happen any time during the study. Thank you. Yes, nice close. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, so you spoke about, you know. Close your you spoke about uh, the potential etiologies for non-compliance, like insufficient training or unqualified staff. So um, could you speak a bit more about, you know, at what time would you determine if it's um, a problem with the site or with the sponsor not providing enough training for the site? That's a good question. Actually, um, I know the sponsors, you know, you have the site initiation visit, so the communication between the sponsor and the uh, site. Um, well, the clinical investigator, by signing the 1572, is responsible to, for the whole conduct of the study. Um, however, uh, the sponsor has its own responsibility so to provide <coughs> adequate monitoring. The sponsor, that's a sponsor requirement. I, my talk was only about <coughs> clinical investigators. So the training, uh, everything is, depends on whether the clinical investigator feels the requirement for the training, the clinical investigator can always access all those different resources that I told you, sponsor, IRB, uh, private consultants, any like FDA guidances. Uh, it depends on when and what is needed. So I don't know your specific question, but uh, sponsor has its own re regulatory requirements too. It's not just the clinical investigator, but for the site, it's the clinical investigator. And, and for those of you who did have follow-ups, uh, Farinac will be available a little later. Let's take one online question, and then we'll come back here in the room. What is the difference between disqualified and debarred? OK, so um, the disqualification ha uh, is a, pro a process that is um, decided by the commissioner, Office of Commissioner. And um, disqualification means uh, the, per the individual is no longer entitled, as I said, to receive any FDA regulatory, requ uh, regulatory products or conduct any uh, FDA regulated research. For debarment, uh, that is not something that I specifically work on. And I can, uh, you can send that question uh, later on to our email box, and I can uh, ask for more details about that. But I know um, I don't specifically work on the debarment. Maybe so our ORA staff can explain. Is there any here? That'll be a good discussion for later. Right up close to the microphone for our last question, please. OK. As a sponsor, uh, if we are in uh, phase three study and we have multiple size, and only one of the multiple size failed FDA inspection, and got a warning letter. And they decided not to spend any more money to fix the problem. And therefore, sponsor the uh, uh, possibility is that because of uh, the pressure from the, inve uh, the investors, uh, we they may close all the deals and then start go down. And the other option would be that can we re-enroll size? Because we know that particular batch size has the root cause. And then we can reuse the uh, successful data from another size. What FDA would advise us to do. Can you ask the last question? What was the FDA? Um, we have a multiple size. Only one of the multiple size have failed FDA inspection. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you just uh, disapprove all the study or you give us another chance to start over again for that bad side and we use all the good size, the data from the good size. Depends on how much of the data was provided by that site. So if it's a significant amount of data from that site, then that's the review division that considers you know, not approving or approving. Because it depends on how much data you received from that site and how unreliable was the data. OK, thank you. 
And I believe you have a closing slide with some final thoughts that you wanted to share before we wrap up. So if there's one thing I would like, I mean, that you learn from this talk uh, is to have a strong infrastructure before you start closing the subjects because you're all here to improve uh, human life. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs>